So I am just so excited today to introduce our, our daily instructor. She'll be here with you for the majority of the time, the four hours that we have today. Um, Diane Allison, she told me not to read her bio, but of course I, I'm breaking the rules again. Um, Diane joined our office in 2021 as the Director of Local Government Services, having served as Chief Financial Officer in three different local governments for a combined total of 17 years. She's been a certified public accountant for over 25 years and holds certifications as a Chartered Global Management Accountant and Certified Government Finance Officer. In 2019, she received the Woman to Watch Award from the Society of, El of Louisiana CPAs she received Louisiana's GFOA Pelican Award at the Fall Conference on October 6, 2023. Please welcome Ms. Diane Allison. Morning, everybody. All right, you are my hardcore buddies. Um, glad to be with you. Um, I am looking forward to presenting IGA. So that's my acronym for Intermediate Governmental Accounting because every time I had to spell it out on my timesheet, I'm like, I'm tired of this. And if you put that many letters in it, I'll make about six or seven typos and transpositions and extra keys. So IGA, we're doing IGA. Now, IGA's not that hard, okay? It's very hard to work the remote, but it's really... Do I have the right remote? Okay. Is it on? It's on. Okay. Plan B. Batteries. You gonna help me, Judy? Judy's gonna help me with batteries. She's gonna get us going. All right. So this is what I want you all to realize. We, you know Mike Wag is back our boss. But we're going to have fun. OK, so intermediate governmental accounting is um, beyond basic, not advanced. It's in the middle. Um, there are no cut and dries of what you define it. So this is how Diane has defined it. And look, dude, it's just like four easy steps. That's all we've got, OK? So we can get this, all of us together working on this, right? We can understand this. And we're going to break it down in little bites. So um, I'm not going to promise. Um, four equal sections of 50 minutes, because I might go long on some and short on the other. But this is basically what we're going to cover this morning. And you guys are going to be rocking and rolling and ready to go. OK, so um, this topic is not for the faint of heart. We are going to get very technical. I'm going to start using all my little acronyms, you know, like the GASB and the GFOA and the, all of those kinds of things. Um, but uh, <coughs> you guys are ready for that? and um, um, to do that, and then you are going to be pros at this. The fun part about it all, too, is we get to take a tour around our beautiful state of Louisiana because I get to show you examples of really outstanding government reporting um, throughout our state. Glad to do it. All right, so for um, intermediate, in, in part one, to learn about um, governmental accounting principles and topics, this is basically what we're going to cover in our first session. GAP, um, we're going to talk about funds, measurement, focus, and basis of accounting, all right? Let's talk about GAP. So GAP is um, who sets the rules. GAP stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. Um, isn't that cute, generally accepted? I mean, there might be some people who do this, but they don't really accept it, right? But you have to. You have to accept it. So, you know, these are one of those things, because I said so. And should it be you want a clean opinion, and that's definitely what you want on your audit report. So who establishes? Top of my list is the GASB, Governmental Accounting Standards Board. They've been around since 1984. Um, through a due process, they establish GAP. I'm going to tell you about that due process in a little bit. Um, so they determine the accounting, OK? But there's more than that. So the Financial Accounting Standards Board, that's their sister organization. So we have GASB for gov state and local governments, we have FASB for the for-profits, and they have the same mom and dad, which is called the Financial Accounting Foundation, FAF. Okay, so this is how this goes. We know this when we work in government. We're the stepchild, right? So um, it happens first to FASB, and then it happens to us. So this is like, you know how we, we always say whatever weather's happening in Houston is going to be happening to us next? 
Well, do you watch the FASB and pretty soon it'll come over to us. Um, although I'm getting very, and I'm going to get really defensive of our governmental accounting when I talk about that because some people think we ought to do away with font. I'm not one of them. Okay. Then there are um, the Auditing Standards Board. So we, we go through annual audits every year. Who sets those standards? It's not the legislative auditor. It's not your auditor. It's the Auditing Standards Board. So they say, here's how to audit. Okay, this is why your auditor's asking you for this stuff, and this is why you give them stuff and they ask for more stuff, because they're following their auditing standards. Those standards apply when they're auditing governments, um, for-profits, not-for-profits, everything. But that's not enough, still not enough, because in government, we have government audit standards. That's established by the U.S. Um, GAO, um, commonly called the Yellow Book. Now, what's the difference? This is key. You all live this every day. And the difference is that government audit standards say they have to check for compliance. So when you're auditing a for-profit, they're just looking like, did you file your 941s? They're really looking at your tax position and things like that. But we have to follow public bid law, you know, open meetings law. We have to have our bank accounts collateralized. We have to have all these things that the law requires us to do. That's the difference. That's the USGAO, governmental auditing standards, called the yellow book. Now, you wish we were done on four, okay, but we still have a few more to go that tell us what, what to do that guide our daily lives and the work that we do. So we have the Office of Management and Budget. There again, that's U.S., and they tell us about our federal funds. So there's a requirement. If you all, you know, this is how it works. My mama taught me. Like, my, my husband says, he who has the gold makes the rules. That's what he told our two boys, because he had the gold. He was the daddy. So when they asked about why do I have to do this, that's what he said. So when federal grantors give us money, there are strings attached. They want you to use it specifically for that program. There are reporting requirements. They want to go and be able to report back to Congress and others on how those funds were used and if it got the desired result. That's your um, federal. That's your single audit. Okay, so that's on top of auditing standards and governmental auditing standards. If you get 750 or more in federal funds, 750,000, now you have single audit. So as if that's not enough, then there are those of us who issue debt. So we issue bonds. Bonds get traded on the financial market. So what happens is you have a project you need to do, and you say, look, I just need, all I need is 80 million, and I can do this project. But hard to raise that money overnight. So what you do is you get your voters, you go before bond commission, get your voters to approve, and um, lo and behold, you issue the bonds and you sell them in the U.S. financial markets. Well, when you do that, MSRB kicks in, Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. Now we're required to do annual disclosures, upload our audits. Why? Because there are bondholders out there who hold your bonds. They want to see your financial information to see how well you're doing and if you can pay back the bonds. So, but look at who the MSRB regulates. Does it say state and local governments anywhere in there? No, it doesn't. They don't regulate us, but they regulate those who work with us on those transactions. And then um, the Louisiana legislature also, they're another one of our, our bosses, right? And they, they adopt laws. For example, thou shalt put an agency head compensation schedule in your audit report. That's a law. So we have those laws to follow. And then as if that's not enough, the legislative auditor sets the terms and conditions under which auditors audit Diane's 3,600 babies, and that's you all. Okay, so plenty of y'all have heard me say, as director of local government services, we have 3,600 local governments who report to us every year, and we have 280 CPA firms. So in my heart, y'all are my babies and I have to take care of you, and I can't have people doing wrong things to you, okay? So that's what that is. So one of the things is we, we watch and, and dictate the terms and conditions under which you will audit my babies. So 200, an approved CPA list. I don't want just anybody auditing y'all. I want somebody who knows governmental accounting 
to audit you guys. That's one way, okay? So then we have those. The big thing that you all know is our statewide agreed upon procedures. That's another thing. And a lot of the terms and conditions under which we audit, um, we let the, uh, the CPA firms audit. Those are all um, in the Louisiana Governmental Audit Guide, which is online and available to you. So um, that's everybody who's our boss. Now, this is how we all interact, and this is the importance of GAP. Okay, so who do we have? We have the citizens, believe me, they are looking for your audit reports. They, I've spent two weeks trying to get audit reports for this one town, okay? They are looking for your audit reports. All kinds of people are looking for your audit reports. Um, I did not know that until I came to work at the Legislative Auditor's Office just two years ago. The investors and the creditors, okay, who are those? Those are people you owe money, like your bank, but also your investors who are buying your bonds, right? And your regulators also, the legislative oversight bodies. That's the federal government who gave you these awards. That's the state who uh, get, got you some grant awards, okay? That may be foundations and things like that if you're getting any kind of grants or award. They're all looking for you. And what's the common thing? Gap. So what they can all rely on is our financial statements. When we do them all, according to GAP, all these different groups can read our financials and understand them. It's the common language. So important. Don't you love this? I mean, I just really love this. Okay, this is so cool. So that's the importance of GAP, okay? It's not just a pain in your neck. Now there's a hierarchy to GAP. Um, there is, um, they have it category A and category B. So category A is the absolute highest authority, um, thou shalt, and those are the GASB statements, the pronouncements um, they call them. So this is what we affectionately call uh, GASB 34 on government-wide financials and GASB 54 on fund balance categories and GASB 87 on leases and all of that. That's the GASB statements, okay? The highest level, the highest level but they're really written in like really technical terms, not for the faint of heart. Um, it, you, you have to like, you just have to keep reading, answering questions, like I read them and I don't get it. I never get it, okay? But I talk to people who are smarter than me. They get it, they explain it to me. And then I ask the almighty question, like how's it different from what we're doing now? So then, you know, accounting for idiots, they explain to me how it's different. Sometimes I can tell, sometimes I can't. Um, so very, very hard, very, very technical. So to help us out with that, GASB has category B. And those are what they call technical bullions um, implementation guides. That's GASB stuff that GASB issues on their website, available for free, gasby.org. Okay. And also, every once in a while, the AICPA, remember they do auditing standards? Okay, so the AICPA <coughs> will talk about governmental things. Well, they're not allowed to talk about governmental things without the GASB's blessing. So that's also in category B. And then there's everything else, okay, which is um, non-authoritative, like this presentation is non-authoritative. So um, I will tell you this, because um, it should give you some level of comfort. The way that they do accounting standards, the GASB issues accounting standards, there's what they call due process. And I've had the pleasure of participating in due process, so let me tell you how it works. The GASB says, out there in practice we have issue. Everybody's not recording this the same. You know, we have to do something. And people will tell them, the investors say, you gotta do something. You know, you have to figure this out. They say, okay. So they research it, and they issue what's called a preliminary views document and they issue it for the public and they say, here's what we're thinking. And then people like, um, I serve on the, at National GFOA, they have, um, I serve on the Accounting, Auditing and Financial Reporting Committee. So everything that GASB dealt, we are on it like gravy on rice. I want you to know that, we are on it. They just issued a new exposure draft, we are on it. So um, what, what we do, or, or, um, people will take a look at it and they'll say, hmm, this is what I like about this, what I don't like about it. And they'll submit letters. GASB will say, okay. And then they'll issue what they call an exposure draft. And an exposure draft says, okay, here's what we're thinking. We got the comments. Now here's like, this is like the draft version of the official standard. 
and they still give you a chance to comment. So, um, and you can go to hearings. So I have actually commented at two hearings in front of the GASB board. It is very intimidating. They don't want you to be intimidated, but it is very, very intimidating. So thankfully, I bring reinforcements. So, which is Michelle Levine, who is GFOA's Director of Technical Assistance and the author of My Gaffer, um, which is basically, I you know, got it. This is the book that um, the government, and that's what this presentation is based on. This is like the governmental accounting book. It's like, I'm old, okay, but, but it's now an e-book, but um, it's our book. So I bring Michelle with me. So we've studied it. We've written our letter. We've talked about it. I know my letter. I know GFOA's position. And so I go and hit the highlights. And then they bombard you with questions from out the blue. So this is what I do. They ask a question, and I look at Michelle, and she answers. <laughs> so it's, it's just, it's really hard. They ask you, like, why? Look, I, I, I work, I've worked for three governments. I do not have a lot of experience, right? I don't have a variety. Um, I just have depth in three governments. So I don't know these things. Um, but they think it's their job, and they think about it. So it's really interesting, and they're actually really nice people. So there is a due process to adopt um, standards. OK, so now that you know how GAP is developed, and so then you always think about the serenity prayer, which starts off, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. OK, GAP you cannot change. Once it's adopted, that's it. So don't waste your energy fussing. I don't like this. I can't stand this. Instead, you need to spend your energy understanding the standard, okay? Understanding what it says, talking to people, trying to figure this stuff out, trying to apply it to your own transactions and things like that. So fund accounting is very is unique to governments, okay? Some nonprofits pull this in um, just because of the benefit of it. And what's the benefit of it? It demonstrates compliance with our legal and contractual um, provisions, and also it's that self-balancing set of accounts. So accountants generally, for those non-accountants in the audience, we like our stuff nice and neat. We like it to balance. We like it to make sense, okay? Um, if we have something that's not aligned, we will reprint the report so that it is aligned. We're just like that. It's, it's how we are, okay? So we want to use funds to separate money so that the goal in life is to be like me, 62 years old and never been to jail, right? That's the goal. So we want to show when we get a grant, we want to put it in its own little fund with its own little expenses to say, see, we did it all right. We did it all right. We got this. So that's what funds are for. Self-balancing, what does that mean? Debits and credits, what does that mean? Um, it, we ha it has balance sheet accounts and it has income statement accounts, okay? So funds, that's what we do. Um, there are categories of funds. There are three categories of funds, um, governmental, proprietary, and fiduciary. We're going to go over these. So governmental funds are used to account for activities primarily supported by taxes, grants. These are our most common funds. There are five types of these. Proprietary funds, I want you to think proprietor. What does that mean? Business, a uh, business motive, a profit motive, right, for proprietary funds. So if you're doing something that has a business motive, um, and what does that mean? Earn a profit. It also means there's a type of proprietary fund where you just at least recover your costs. So it doesn't cost you anything. Um, not so much in governmental funds. It, you, you Look. K-12 public school is a perfect example. We, uh, we don't charge anything for public education. It's free. You know, so what do you expect to have? Like, it's got to be funded by taxes and things like that because it's not funded by tuition. And then fiduciary funds, the thing to think of that is other people's money. Other people's money. Those are the least favorite types of bank accounts that my husband and I have. He can't stand when it's one of those can't have your money accounts. That's what fiduciary is. It's someone else's money that the government is holding. We'll take a look at those. Okay, for our governmental funds, now this all goes to your financial statements to help you understand your financial statements. Let me tell you, of the four presentations, this one's the hardest. Once you got this, y'all were coasting. 
for the other three, but we have to get the basics down first. Okay, five types of funds. Every government has a general fund. It's your main operating fund, okay? Hands down, it's your main operating fund, the general fund. Then there are special revenue funds. GASB 54 changed this a little bit, but some old dogs, not like me, don't like to learn new tricks. And so the special revenue funds, the new definition is you have to have a sustained revenue source to record it in a special revenue fund. But a lot of us like to record things in special revenue funds that are dedicated expenditures as well. So you might get a one-time grant and you want to put it in a special revenue fund because you want to match the expenditures with that one-time grant. Okay, those are special revenue funds. We have a gazillion of these. By the way, trivia question. GAAP does not require you to use these funds. You will see that only there's only a requirement to use an, an enterprise fund in GAAP. So you don't have to use special revenue funds. My friend Michelle that I told you about, she's the former comptroller for the city of New York, and she says they don't have any special revenue funds. I'm like, good Lord, the city of New York, the largest city in the country, no special revenue funds. How do you sleep at night? Like, that would drive me nuts. Like, I got to have my special revenue fund. I got to make sure everything's right. Capital projects funds, that's kind of easy. That's our capital outlay. Why do we put these guys in their own, in their own fund? Um, have the option to put them in their own fund. Because all good accountants love to watch their general fund, love to identify the trends, love to understand what's going on in their governments, right? And you put a huge, like our $80 million capital project, in the general fund and it throws your numbers off and it could, that project could be over two or three years it throws them off you don't like it because then every time you're trying to do a budget and explain this year to last year you got this capital project messing you up every time so to avoid that we put it in the capital projects fund and call it a day and that fund go whoop 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 it has a lot of money it doesn't and things like that okay it varies and then we have debt service funds so for those of us that issue debt this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is where your debt activity is recorded. Your principal and interest payments um, get recorded there. These are most of the time required by the creditors that you owe the money to. They're like, dude, we want to see the money coming in that you're paying us debt service from, and we want to see the outflow. We want to see the interest payments and the principal payments, and we don't want it all like put in the, some will put it, depending on the, on the revenue stream, some will record debt in their general fund, but a lot of people will separate it out into debt service funds. And then there are permanent funds. So what are permanent funds? Now, true confession, I have never accounted for a permanent fund. You see these at universities a lot. This is, this is one of those can't have your money accounts, right? So you get, think of an endowment. You get a bunch of money you can't spend, but you can spend the earnings off of it. So you see this at universities a lot. All right, let's bring it home. Bossier City. So in Bossier City, whoop, in Bossier City, they have some special revenue funds. So here's what they're accounting for in special revenue funds. This could be too much fun. This is just, I love this stuff. Okay, so they have one fund where they record both state and federal grants. Um, some do that, some put their grants all in there, put state grants in their general fund. Look, we do it all kind of ways. We do it all kind of ways. Um, for Bossier City, they have that separate. Then they have a court witness fee. They have, pay attention to a civic center. We're going to come back and talk about civic centers. For Bossier City, they put their civic center in a special revenue fund. I got another city that puts their civic center in an enterprise fund. When we talk about enterprise funds, then when you all get asked tonight when you're watching the Saints get beat up by the Jacksonville Jaguars and they ask you about it, you will be able to explain why Bossier City puts it in a special revenue fund and why another city does not. Okay, y'all are going to be that good. All right. Um, their hotel motel, their disaster relief. So a lot of us have these kind. It just shows you the kinds of activities. And, um, and then they have their major special revenue funds. So in... To get you all to come back to part two, the hook is, I'm going to explain major and non-major funds in part two, okay? So if you just stay for part one, like you're going to miss, and you're not going to know the difference and how to calculate it. That's part two, okay? So they have riverboat gaming, not gambling because it's illegal in Louisiana. 
and um, their arena is in um, special revenue funds, all right? City of Slidell, they got some capital projects funds going on. So take a look, we talk about debt. Take a look at the title of their capital projects funds. They have two, general obligation bonds 2016 and 2010. One's major, one's non-major. What's up with that? See the $80 million project? When they issue bonds, they get their money. This is what happens when you issue bonds. It's a beautiful day. All your elected officials love to come. You go to your bond attorney's office. You have closing. You, the finance officer, are on the phone. Where's the money? Where's the money? Because it goes into your bank account. And then you say, got the money? Yeah, got the money. Okay, everybody's good. So I now have $80 million in my bank account. So Slidell had $80 million that was used just for those projects in that bond. And that's why they put that in a capital projects fund. So in all likelihood, what they did is they went to their voters and they said, look, we need you all to approve issuing debt so that we can build this project. And the voters said, absolutely, sure, we'll do that. So now they're putting it in their fund. And when you think about how they spend it, one's major, one's non-major, which basically means the, the, the relative size of the fund, okay? The 2010, we're at the end, whatever fiscal year this is, right? So they've spent probably a lot of that there at the tail end of those projects, but 2016, they're still working on spending those. So that's where you see um, a capital projects fund, right? And then Katrina fund, God bless them. How many people have a Katrina fund still? Okay, let me see. All right, we got one in person and we have, yeah, about 18 online, Marshall, that have Katrina funds. <laughs> so, um, yeah, still going on, still going on. It's a big thing um, for that. Um, Ascension Parish School Board, they have four debt service funds. So these people are really want to keep, this is the value of fund accounting. They say, I want to keep each one separate because I want to show that legal compliance, okay, with that. They may have four, there are four different things. I know there are different sections of the tax code on these, and so they wanted to keep it separate so their creditors can go look whichever bonds they hold and see those, okay, um, for their debt service funds and see the payments. So um, those are debt, sir, those are what you see when they issue those. Um, permanent funds. Um, here are some for the state of Louisiana. A lot of school districts know the Education Excellence Fund. And then a lot of us know the TOPS Fund at the bottom, right? Because either um, us or our children um, were beneficiaries of TOPS funding. Well, now you know. You see, TOPS is a permanent fund in the state of Louisiana. That means they have the corpus they can't spend, and then they spend, they spend the earnings on it. All right, let's go to proprietary funds. Two types of proprietary funds. This is when you're thinking business purpose. This is when you're thinking for profit. I need you to keep thinking that because that's going to carry out through the other th presentations for these, right? So um, enterprise funds, according to GAAP, may be used for activities in which a fee is charged to external users. So let's walk through this. I got a museum. I'm charging a fee. I can put it in an enterprise fund. If any of you operate a museum, I am willing to bet that you don't charge the full cost because let's say it would cost $100. People aren't going to pay $100 to come to the museum. So you're going to subsidize it and you're going to say, okay, 20 bucks. And they're like, okay, 20 bucks to come to the museum because you want people to come to the museum, right? And you don't want it to be cost prohibitive. So you can use an enterprise fund. GAAP requires you to use an enterprise fund. This is the only fund, okay? It's your trivia question. They require it when there's outstanding debt backed solely by fees or when laws or regulations um, require that they're recovered or there's a pricing policy. Okay, so um, for a lot of us in municipalities, think of your utilities. This is, this is the kind of fund that your utilities are in. You may have water, you may have sewer, you may have gas. Um, these are where they go because they have that profit motive, okay? A lot of them have debt that's issued that's based on paying back those utility fees that people are paying. And then there are internal service funds. So an internal service fund is not for external people. 
It's for internal people. So it's what a government uses to charge other funds, other departments. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of those. But the whole point is on a cost reimbursement basis, okay, on a cost reimbursement basis. So different, we're going to see different kind of accounting for these types of funds because of that profit motive, right? Governments are governmental funds. We don't have a profit motive. What do we have? A service motive. We're here to provide a service for you. Um, so let's take a look at Calcasieu Parish. Calcasieu Parish has some non-major enterprise funds, and you can see they operate waterworks. They have a ton of them. They've got, what is that, five? Um, three waterworks, two sewer districts. Okay, so that's an example of um, enterprise funds. And then Lafayette Consolidated Government, um, right here. They have internal service funds. So what do they do? They, have, um, they do their central vehicle maintenance. So when you think about it, for a consolidated city parish, they have all kinds of vehicles. So instead of saying police vehicles and police and public transportation vehicles in this department and dump trucks in that department, they're like, dude, we're going to take them all in have a mechanic shop, take care of all of our vehicles, and we're going to charge those different departments cost reimbursement basis. That's what they're doing there. Also, they're self-insured. So larger governments will be self-insured, and that's where that goes also <coughs> when they self-insure. All right? Y'all got this. This is so good. Isn't this good? This is just phenomenal. I love this stuff. For what, whatever kind of activity we have, we got a fund for that. All right. The last fund type are fiduciary funds. So fiduciary funds, um, some of this is really advanced governmental accounting. Um, so uh, this is where I talk fast and you listen fast. So there are four types, three of which involve trusts, okay? And depending on what the activity is, is the type of trust. So there's the pension and other post-employment trusts. There's the investment um, trust funds. And then if it doesn't meet either of those two and it's a trust, we call that private purpose. Trust, trust document, okay? And then all the other money that you're holding for someone else that's not the government's, that can't be used in government operations, that goes into a um, custodial fund. So custodial funds are things like, for those of you who don't know, um, in a court system, when um, we're fighting over money, right, then they say, okay, the, who's got the money? Diane does. Put it in the registry of court fund, then y'all go work your case through the system, and at the end, the judge says, he gets the money. Pay it out of that. And so in the registry of court is money held that they don't know who it belongs to. It's got to be adjudicated. That's, it's not the court's money. They can't use it for payroll. Uh, they don't know who it belongs to. It's going to sit there for a while. The, some that have jails, a jail inmate, depends, depends, but some jail inmate accounts meet the requirement to be custodial funds. Some don't. Some have to be special revenue funds. All right. So um, here are some we know and love. How many of us invest in LAMP? You know, a lot of governments invest in LAMP. Um, look, now you know. LAMP's an investment trust fund for the state. Is that not cool? I think that's so cool. Like, you don't know that when you get your LAMP statement. You're like, dude, I got to get my LAMP statement. I got to balance with my GL, and I got to record my my earnings, right? That's all you're thinking. But now, you know, this is an investment trust fund for the state. So good for you. And then the state pensions are also pension trust funds, right? We got this. All right. Now, any questions? <clears throat> this is where Liz comes in. Any questions? Judy, you have a question? Sorry, I had to get my mic working. Can a permanent fund also be considered a special revenue fund? No, no. Those are two different. Can a permanent fund be a special revenue fund? No, two different fund types. Pick one. Pick one. And the thing is that can, the, 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 it all depends on the money that you get, your body of money that you can spend. So in a special revenue fund, dude, you're spending it. It's revenues for expenditure, right? In a permanent fund, it's a pot of money, like an endowment that somebody leaves that says, here's a ton of money, and you can only spend the earnings off of it. I'm a scholarship trustee I, I, um, for a scholarship, and we have one like that, you know, that we watch. So, um, so th those kinds. So two different kinds you have to pick. Um, and then in the course of choosing, 
go read GASB 54 and document your decision and how you reach your conclusion and then just don't start your accounting call your auditor say look here's what I'm thinking what you think you know and then your auditor will be sounds good or no 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 you got it all wrong and then you'll get it right you don't want to do the work for your auditor for and I have and one more question on specially geared just for you yeah in Louisiana are school boards required to have special revenue funds mm -mm. they're not required by gap gap doesn't require we only we found our one little kind of fund that gap requires right however your grantor may require you know the law may require you to have um, um, for you to have a, a special revenue fund but gap does not so the all-important thing of knowing your grants you know there's no substitute for you get a grant you read your grant award and you're like okay I got to figure this out you know and I have to abide by this grant award and then you have to learn how to speak federalese and all kinds of other things like that but yep all right we good everybody knows all right let's move on to measurement focus and basis of accounting measurement focus there are two current financial and economic resources this that gets just gets to the heart of governmental accounting and I love this stuff and this is where we need to be defensive and stand strong and where we're so very different from our for-profit um, companies that all they want to do is make money and should they have an asset that's not performing they sell it so that they can make money and it's all about uh, about profit for us it's all about serving our citizens they need roads to drive on that are up to standard they need um, they need to send their kids to school right to get an education um, they need us to take care of stray animals roaming the streets they need police protection and fire protection um, they need all of that that's what we're here for we're public servants to serve our communities and that's what this gets to so current financial resources is here and now what do I have to spend okay so and in short what it means is no long-term stuff okay no long-term stuff no long-term assets no long-term liabilities we're going to we have a couple of slides to show you Diane honey when I get cash I got to record some other entry how do I record those things if there's no long-term assets no long-term responsibilities I got an answer for that we'll see it okay so it's just current stuff why because when I build a building with my 80 million dollars I build a new school that's it I'm done with that school I am never gonna look at that school and say wow that's on a main street if I sold that that could be they could do a shopping center there I could make a gazillion bucks no 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 it's not what governments do it's not what we do our assets are not for us to make money our assets are for us to provide a service so once you spent your 80 million you're done you spent the money you're think you're not thinking about anything else called a return on investment you're done okay current financial resources so capital assets are out of sight out of mind okay when it comes to that long-term liabilities <laughs> this is where it gets like us like my little checkbook right we're like so okay so I signed it to pay um, on my house 30-year mortgage but you know that long-term stuff I'm not thinking I owe all that money up front right I'm just going month to month with my monthly mortgage same thing here same thing here the long-term liabilities how I'm gonna pay back that 80 million dollars over 20 years I'm not worried about paying that stuff back right I'm just worried about my in my within my next year my liabilities so I'm focusing on my current financial resources because that's what I have to fund my government and to serve my community and to get them the things that they need that's what that is so those are um, that is the measurement focus of those governmental funds okay those five types those are our most common funds right that's the focus current financial resources we're not so much worried about the long-term stuff for that um, and then we don't look at that unmatured portion that 80 million I look at the close by stuff all right economic this is what we learned in school 
um, in, in all of our accounting, economic resources, and what is this? This is everything. This is everything. So you see that $80 million building that we built? Um, that's a capital asset that I'm going to depreciate over its useful life. So it's not like in my fund level where I just spent the money and I'm done with it. No, 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 no. I have an asset on my books, and then I depreciate. I take a portion because it declines in value conceptually um, over its useful life, and I expense a portion of that every year, right? Um, for my debt, when I issued that $80 million in debt, guess what? I owe the whole $80 million back. You cannot forget about the amount you owe back. You have to book it. That's a liability. So economic resources looks at everything, okay? And this is the focus of our proprietary and our fiduciary funds. Now, you all understand why it's proprietary funds, right? That's our business motive. Because in a proprietary fund, if that asset isn't working for us, we're, we're going to have to sell that asset. <coughs> in a, a fiduciary fund, it's not really even our money, but it, most of it is long-term stuff there, too. All right? So that's the focus of those. Also, um, part three, we're going to get to government-wide. Y'all are going to understand government-wide financials. I, I am convinced of it. We're going to understand it, okay? Government-wide are also economic resources. It's everything. It's not just some stuff. So this is a lot. Um, the current financial resources is where we get criticized in government for being so very different from the for-profit world, and the for-profit world doesn't understand it, and they fuss at us, and I'm like, dude, I don't care if my school building is, er is giving me a return on investment. There are 2,000 students at that high school learning every day, so it's good. Leave it alone, you know, kind of thing. But they don't, they don't get it. They get confused. Mike and Zena said if he were king, we wouldn't have funds. So I tell Mike and Zena, I'm glad you're not king because I like my funds. I understand my funds very, very, very well. I understand the reason for my funds. All right. So let's take a look at this, because here's your cheat sheet. <laughs> we all need cheat sheets. All right. So financial resources, what are those? That's our cash and the things that turn into cash, like receivables, investments, things like that, right? So on our, on our financial resource, they're in both places. They're in both places. But capital assets, nope, they're not in our current, but they are in our economic resources, OK? Um, liabilities normally expected to be liquidated with currently available financial resources, oh yeah, we've got those. That's like one year from our financial statement date. We got those in our current financial resources, and we have those in our long term. But those ones that are that $80 million, my bond payment that I have to make in the year you know, 2032, that isn't in my balance sheet for my fund. It's, it's not there. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, but it is on my economic resources, OK? So that's a big thing to keep in mind. Um, the other thing, here you go. So this answers the question, Diane, honey, when I built my $80 million building, I credit cash. What do I do with the doggone debit? So here's what you do. Um, when, for principal and interest, when we make those debt service payments, so full economic resources, what are we doing? We're reducing that liability. But at the fund level, in our debt service fund, we're just going to other uses of funds. OK? That's where we're hitting that up. Principal and interest go there. Um, when we get debt proceeds, this is our favorite part. We love this part. When we had bond closing day, and we were chasing the money, and we're on the phone, and the money made it into the bank account, and then the paying agent got paid, and the underwriter got paid, and everybody got paid, and everybody's good, OK? Then you say, OK, I got 80 million bucks. We get to record it as revenue. Is that not cool? So that's another financing source, right? In our, um, probably in a capital projects fund, in the example we're using, right? So that's where that goes. Capital asset acquisitions, there again, we're just expending them. When we're building that $80 million building and every month we get the contractor payment, we're just recording that as an expenditure. And then um, from the sale of capital assets, um, what do we do there? Again, it all goes under other financing sources and uses. Okay, so we're just expensing it on our income statement. We're not doing these, recording these transactions on our balance sheet. 
And then we have our newest um, accounting standards that weigh heavy on our minds, GASB 87 leases and 96 um, subscription-based IT arrangements for the kinds of um, computing uh, software that we have, like ERP systems and stuff that's located in the cloud. Um, those are, we just record as expenditures. The new standards say you have to book those as liabilities. They're financing kind of things. So um, economic resources, okay? So what do we do here? This is the stuff we learned in school. This is the for-profit accounting. This is where all everybody who came from for-profit accounting, we know this. Our question is, why do you do it the other way? Okay, so capital asset, just like we learned in school. We book an asset, we depreciate it over the cost of its useful life. Um, leases and, and sabitas, when we have those, now Gasby says we're booking those as a liability and we're amortized and an intangible asset that we're amortizing over um, a fixed period of time. Debt proceeds. When we get debt proceeds, we debit cash, we credit a liability. We owe the money, we don't credit revenue. Okay, we credit liability, we owe it back. When we re make those principal payments, we're reducing that liability. Compensated absences, when Diane Allison takes vacation, we record that in fund level as an expense. Um, for economic resources, those are liabilities. Um, that they owe me my vacation, right? That I've earned through time. And then, um, and then there are also deferred inflows and outflows of funds. So. That's measurement focus, okay? So keep that in your mind, current economic, whether or not it includes long-term assets, long-term liabilities. That's just kind of like the summary of 10 slides and Diane talking too much. Okay, so now let's talk about our basis of accounting. Two kinds of, well, there, for some there are three bases of accounting. I'm not gonna cover cash basis, but I am gonna compare it in a few slides. So we have the accrual basis of accounting. Some will say full accrual basis of accounting. Okay, so this basis of accounting, this says when. Diane, when do I get to call that revenue? When do I have to record that expense, um, recognize it on my income statement, okay? So revenues, easy, kind of like when earned. You know, harder when, you, when we're gonna drill down on some of those, okay? But basically when earned, Expenses when a liability is incurred, it's called expenses. Um, for uh, modified accrual that we'll see, it's called expenditures. Um, not So we can distinguish between the two. Um, and so we use this with the economic resources um, measurement focus, okay? So full accrual goes with economic resources. What kinds of funds? our proprietary funds, our fiduciary funds, and our government-wide statements. Got it? See, I told you this was easy. Didn't I tell you this was easy? It's easy. We got this. Okay. Modified accrual. Yeah, we got accrual and then like, yeah, but. Right? Yeah, but. So revenues when earned, but also when collectible. Why? We have that current financial resources, that current resources focus. So if I won't get it for a long, long time, I'm not going to book it as revenue. So we each get to define when, when our collectible period is. Generally, for a lot of governments, it's either 60 or 90 days. Um, so that's when revenues are. So it has to be collectible. So your property taxes may not be collectible. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, expenditures when a liability is incurred, except, see that's why we call it modified accrual, right? Except for um, accrued interest, unmatured debt kind of things. So this is the basis of accounting. This goes with those current financial resources and this goes with our governmental funds, our five types of governmental funds. So this is what we do here when we record it. So what will happen is you're going to record your revenues how you record your revenues. And then your auditor is going to come in and your auditor is going to make some audit adjustments when we have to convert to the, when he has to prepare the government-wide statements, okay? We're going to, we're going to book a, a couple of little journal entries there. So let's go over revenue and let's compare the three kinds of accounting, all right, in our basis of accounting. So for full accrual, it's when it's earned. End of discussion. End of discussion. When we earn it, book it. Okay? Modified accrual, you got to earn it, but it's also got to be measurable. <clears throat> you have to know how much, and it's got to be available. 
within the however you define that collectible period. So it may not be earned. If people take a very, very long time to pay, like six months, you may have earned it, but if you don't collect it for six months, dude, it's not revenue. It's not if you're the six months after the end of your fiscal year. It's not revenue. You can book it as revenue in your 60 or 90 days after the end of your fiscal year, right? So that's some journal entries that your auditor is going to make. And then cash basis, I know there are governments that will keep their books on a cash basis internally. Cash basis is not GAAP. So for cash basis, but it is the way Diane works on her checkbook, right? When I get my paycheck, I have my deposit in. And then I write my bills to go out, right? Cash basis, when cash is dispersed. So that's when I actually get the money in my hand and put it in the bank for that. So property taxes, let's take a look at property taxes. When are they earned? Um, under the three methods, when do we book them? Okay, for property taxes under the accrual, it's when they're levied. That's generally like in the summer, the fall, you're supposed to have them all levied and send all stuff to your assessor by June 1, but it's been a while, don't quote me on that. Joanne Garrison is our expert. Um, it, for modified accrual, it's when it's available when it's available, right? And then for cash basis, it's when I get it in my hands. Okay, let's look at sales taxes. Sales taxes. Under the accrual method, it's when Diane Allison is at the cash register buying yet one more pair of shoes. Okay, so that's when that happens. Modified accrual, there again, when it's available to spend. Because we all know in month one, I'm, Diane's at the cash register. In month two, the merchant sends the money to my sales tax collector. And in month three, the sales tax collector sends me the money to the government, right? So depends. See? Sales tax. And then um, under cash basis when received. So you see the differences? You see the differences here, what's going on um, for revenue? I think this is so cool. This is just so cool. All right. Let's take a look at the expense side for this. Expense slash expenditure, because we're going to use the right terminology. Um, under the accrual basis, we have them um, when the liability is incurred. End of discussion. Under the modified accrual, yeah, but, you know, I got a little caveats. I got a couple of exceptions here, right? The unmatured debt, let me just go ahead and go through those. Oop, sorry. <clears throat> Um, accrued interest and then some accrued liabilities like compensated absences is that big long bullet and prepaids. And then cash, it doesn't matter when dispersed. Now this is the slide where you can see how cash basis is not gap. Why? Because too easily manipulated. So think about this. I can record all that revenue and all those deposits, right? But as long as I'm not dispersing funds, like my expenses are way low. We got a surplus this month. Now, I'm sitting in the dark because I haven't paid the utility bill, but I have a surplus. That makes no sense. Too easily manipulated, not gap. But a lot of people understand it very easily. And when you're watching that checkbook balance, you know, it's, it's very important for that. Okay, so let's talk about modified accrual, those three, those exceptions. So debt service expenditures, when due? Okay, so the $80 million that's due in 2030, I don't have to record. The part of that principal payment that's within a year of the end of my financial report, I have to record that. Okay? Um, compensated absences, that's when due and payable. That's when Diane takes vacation. Okay? And they're actually paying me for that week. Um, you don't have to book all of my unused leave forever <clears throat> under modified accrual. And then prepayments go two ways. Y'all don't know this, but now you know this. And you will go look in your note one that we're going to talk about at some point, um, third section, um, third part about um, prepayments because there are two governments have choices. Here's a choice, both gap, purchases or consumption method. So some governments will do purchase method, which is when I buy it, I expense the whole thing. So think about your insurance. It's for a whole year. So the month I write the check, I can expense it right away. Or I can do consumption, which means proportionately I can do 1 12th and do a prepaid schedule and take 1 12th of that over the 12 months. So we have a choice, both are gap. We disclose which one it is there. So those are the exceptions. So you see, you got this, right? It's not that hard. We got this. So now we know the three different kinds of bases of accounting. 
Um, let's talk about transactions here. This gets a little, this is going to get like a little nerdy on you, all right? So um, we have two kinds of transactions because this speaks to when you recognize revenue, okay? We have exchange and exchange like, and then we have non exchange. So exchange and exchange like means it's very similar in value. So um, let's talk about the museum, where the true cost of that would be 100 bucks, but we're only charging $20 admission. That's an exchange-like transaction, OK? An exchange transaction is my um, utility that I'm paying to my um, enterprise fund for my water service. That's an exchange. That's equal value. Diane, honey, this is how much it costs for your 2,000 gallons of water you use this month. Okay, um, so there's equal value to both parties. Non-exchange, it's not equal. It's not equal, and those are generally funded by those taxes and grants. Okay, so now your question is, um, when do I recognize revenue? So non-exchange goes through, there are four kinds of non-exchange transactions. This is too much fun. This is just, this is so cool. Okay, all right. So let's go with derived tax revenues, because what kind it is, is when you recognize it in your financial statements. That's why we have to know this, OK? Not only that, but we just love this stuff. All right. Derived tax revenues are not related to the government's own, but it incurs it within my jurisdiction, wherever Diane buys her shoes, OK? So some of us may have had hotel rooms in Lafayette, but um, we live in another parish. But if we didn't bring our sales tax form, we paid our sales taxes. Or when we went to go eat at a restaurant in Lafayette. It incurred in Lafayette, right? Um, so that's derived tax revenues, OK? Sales tax. Think about that. Then there's imposed non-exchange. OK, so the, this is one of the worst kind, right? These are the thou shalts. So thou shalt pay thy property taxes and fines and penalties um, somebody told me that my speeding ticket is for the privilege of driving over the speed limit on their city streets. And I said, well, you know, that's a privilege. I mean, I'm willing to pay for that. You know, okay, you know. But that's imposed, right? That's imposed. So property taxes. So to our friends who work in assessor's offices, <laughs> we know you get these calls. They're so funny. So the taxpayer calls and says, I got my property tax bill. I am willing to pay these four taxes, but I'm not paying any of the others. So I'm just going to write you a check for this amount. And the assessor says, no, honey, that's not how it goes. you got to pay your whole property tax bill imposed. Okay, Even though when you went to the polls, you said, I do not like this tax. No, it doesn't matter, because the majority said, yes, you have to pay the tax. Okay, That's imposed on you. Um, um, they are not exchanged. <laughs> They're not exchanged. All right, government mandated non-exchange. Here's another thou shalt. What does that mean? That is a funded mandate. So I go back to my school board days. The state says um, thou shalt educate children um, to a school board. Here's the minimum foundation program, which is a grant to do so. Here you go. That's a funded mandate, OK? That's a um, government mandated non-exchange. Required to do it. Here's some money. Doesn't pay the full cost. Every business manager will tell you that. And then there's voluntary non-exchange. These are the grants that we apply for. So um, look, if any of you, I bet many of you have had disasters where you have FEMA. Now, FEMA is a crazy process that goes on for years and has many, many steps. However, should you get frustrated on a bad day, you're like, I just don't want to follow the rules, OK? You don't have to, because it is a voluntary non-exchange, right? Um, grants that you may apply for, um, that you qualify for, voluntary, strictly voluntary. You don't have to do those. All right, so you have to know these to know when you're going to do your revenue. So let's go through them. Revenue recognition on derived tax revenues, you do it when the underlying transaction occurs, derived, where, like I said, for Diane, when she's at the cash register, okay, for her sales tax, when the sale takes place is when I recognize that receivable and the, and the revenue. The revenue recognition has the caveat, 
okay? It's got to be collectible and available, right? So whether it's a 60-day, a 90-day, whatever that is. So you'll see that um, for everyone for the revenue side, all right? Income tax, that's at the state level when we pay income taxes to the state, right? When the income is earned. But don't forget, it's got to be measurable, right? So, um, uh, and we, we, they learn that when we send in our, um, our W-2s. Well, they estimate that one with our um, reporting on our income taxes. All right, let's take our imposed non-exchange, thou shalt. When do we recognize those revenues? We recognize the receivable for property tax on the lien date, okay? So the lien date is when your bill is late and they can file a lien. So for most of us in Louisiana, let me see if I can get this right. The lien date, your property taxes are due December 31, and the lien date is January 1, right? Except for Orleans Parish, they're different, okay? So um, that's your lien date. That's your lien date. Um, or the, um, but in governmental funds, what are we doing? It's got to be deferred until the amounts are available. We have the, all the time, that 60 and 90 day kind of thing. So the start of the period for which it is levied. So for most parishes, we're paying it in arrears. So my bill for January 1, 2023 to December 31, 2023 is due on December 31, 2023. So if I have a January to December fiscal year, that's when I'm going to recognize my revenue, right? My lien date is going to be January 1. Now, we know that, that we might not that we don't collect those taxes till January and February, our favorite months of the year when we get our property tax payments from our tax collector, right? So you watch your 60 and your 90 days with that. It varies. So it's not a one size fits all answer because we have to know what we're doing. For ones that have June 30th fiscal year, y'all don't even like, it doesn't even phase you because it doesn't cross fiscal years for you. Fines and penalties, when they are acknowledged by the individual. Oh yes, I do owe that speeding fine um, for that. And then um, by the court or when they're imposed, okay? That's when we recognize those. All subject to that availability um, and whatever that is in your in your area for non-exchange transactions, when the um, for these, it's when the eligibility re um, requirements are met. Expenditure-driven grants. When you're eligible, when are you eligible? When you spent the money, okay? You may get the grant award for a hundred thousand dollars, but you have to spend the money to be eligible for the revenue, okay? So that's what these are. Um, the, um, the government mandated when they're, and they can have time requirements as well and uh, for that, okay? So when your expenditures are incurred, so think of FEMA, your FEMA that's big, big, big stuff. You actually book that when FEMA obligates the money. So first FEMA says, we're gonna write up a project worksheet for all this damage, okay. Um, and then they say it comes to $50 million. Well, okay, I wish it was more, but that's good, okay. And uh, you still can't book until FEMA says, boom, it's obligated. Then you're like, yes. Now, it can take many years, and auditors know that, for FEMA to pay. But once it's obligated, you're good to go to, to book those. All right. And then the last group is your voluntary non-exchange for those. There again, we have formula grants. We have expenditure-driven grants. And um, when those eligibility requirements are met is basically at that. So with those caveats, all right, y'all are good to go. Any questions? Okay, this is the basis for everything else, okay? So feel free to return back to your cheat sheets. We are going to take a 10-minute break, and then we're going to be back for so much more fun because we get to go over fun financial statements. <laughs>